Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. I have someone very special with me, Bharat Karnad, who's an author, a strategic thinker, a commentator on India's national security. Sir, thank you so much for joining me to uh, understand your views on the strategic th threats that India faces uh, today and some of your views with regards to how we can deal with it in the future. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I look forward to uh, interacting with you. And hopefully, in so far as this is an avocation for you, uh, it's far more interesting than the uh, the usual platforms um, that interview people. So I look forward to it. Thank you, sir. So let's let's just open up with a with a you know outside. What is what are India's strategic threats today? Of course, uh, loosely speaking, everybody will say Pakistan, China, and so on and so forth. But how would you categorize India's threats? Yeah, I mean. Um, you know, there's something called a meta-strategic threat that we don't deal with. The meta-strategic is climate and so on. So, you know, I mean, that's there. But also, as I see it, and I've sort of hinted at it in my 2015 book, Why India is Not a Great Power Yet, um, and it is the reluctance of the what I call the P5, the present members of the Security Council, who virtually rule the world uh, in so far as, at least they did uh, in earlier times, uh, by early, I mean as late as five years ago, say. Uh, Ukraine and everything is, you know, what followed in its wake has blown that up. And it's a very good thing from India's point of view. The meta strategic threat there comes from the reluctance of these P5 powers to admit new members uh, who are legitimately, uh, should legitimately be uh, among their ranks. And so um, that is something, and these are friendly states, by, by the way, you know, we, we are friendly with Russia, we are friendly with the United States, uh, with China, not so uh, much. Uh, then there's UK and France who virtually are, uh, you know, shall we say, we upkeep the defense industries and have in the past. Um, so um, four out of the five uh, still means it's not just China. There is a general shall we say, a consensus amongst these five bars and not to let uh, expand the club, as it were, and in a sense, dilute their own authority and their own um, exercise of power uh, that their membership of the Security Council in particular gives them. So that is something that we need to be aware of. There is a meta strategic threat uh, involving friendly states. So this is the uh, thing there that we need to be aware of. Um, and of course, now you get down to the more mundane quotidian notions of a strategic threat. Uh, the strategic threat is only one, and that is China. Pakistan is not a threat, as I keep saying, I have been saying for 35 years, and I've been borne out, really, what all these things have been borne out, uh, my views. Uh, hopefully now they're getting into the military's thinking as well, uh, that uh, Pakistan is a nuisance, not a threat. Uh, you deal with nuisance in a very different way uh, than you deal with the threat. Threat requires a military response and military build-up. Uh, a nuisance, uh, uh, especially in the tactical sphere, uh, requires uh, various, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, modes of uh, response and proactive activity. You know, in terms of say, well, uh, you know, there's this fiction. Let me just allude a bit to why it is that. Uh, Pakistan is considered, even by Western uh, analysts, who people in India, for some reason, give high regard to what their views are, is they talk about the stability-instability paradox, which you may have heard of, uh, which, by, you know, which, is, which contends that you know, uh, Pakistan can, uh, because of the nuclear overhang, uh, they have an advantage in going conventional, or subconventional, and that India will not be able to respond for fear of the Pakistanis initiating a nuclear uh, exchange or nuclear war. Now, this I find completely idiotic because you know what is the uh, conventional threat? You no, know, we far we are far superior to Pakistan in the conventional military, and in terms of uh, asymmetric subconventional warfare, they have all the advantages. I mean, I'm not saying we are doing it, but let's say Baluchistan or Baltistan or any of the things. So this paradox is idiotic, and it's something that in, that was invented at the Henry Stimson Center by incident. Very incidentally, I used to argue with its founding president at the time. I was there for a few months. 
uh, in the 1990s. Now, I could at the time the foolishness of this sort of thinking, uh, but it's there. Now, why has it been given air? And, you know, I'll talk about the strategic threat regarding China, but Pakistan threat seems to be the stumbling block for us. Uh, for one reason, because we understand Pakistanis better than we uh, can read the Chinese, isn't it? I mean, what we understand by way of uh, threat and the enemy uh, seems more real than something that we don't understand. We can't have, uh, we don't have a grip on. And therefore, we tend to, in a sense, poo-poo it. Uh, or or seek alternative solutions to dealing with China. Uh, but Pakistan first, Pakistan is far too familiar. Uh, and then therefore, in uh, both Pakistan and India, it breeds contempt for each other. And ultimately, what is the what, is, what are India-Pakistan relations? It's an externalization of the Hindu-Muslim tensions at home. Mm -hmm. And this is the stuff that needs to be realized. The unfortunate thing, though, is that this has been converted into some kind of a threat uh, by the military. And, and this is this is the stuff that I've been fighting against for 35, 40 years uh, since I came back from California, where, you know, you uh, I've been schooled in, the, you know, the security aspects that are hard power based and, and in, in hard real, real politic context. So when someone says Pakistan is a threat and our entire policies for years together have uh, fixated on Pakistan and pivoted on Pakistan, it tells something about us. It doesn't say anything about, anything about the threat that Pakistan actually poses. And this this the case I've been making in all my books, that really uh, the greatest success that Pakistan foreign policy and military policy has had is for India to consider Pakistan a threat and make it a primary concern of ours. Um, mm. this, this is the ironic thing, uh, that Pakistan has achieved great success at our expense, simply because we seem not to be rooted in reality. And we seem to be rooted in our prejudices very different things, um, you know, and whether Pakistan uh, likewise is rooted in prejudice is irrelevant simply because they're really nowhere in the picture in realistic terms. Uh, you know, they talk about uh, one Pakistani or a Muslim being, uh, you know, the equal of five Hindus, some nonsense like that. You know, they have been disabused of that notion, but in, in, in terms of the ideological prop that they have, you know, we are still the great martial warriors, which is the kind of, uh, you know, fiction that the and myth and legend that the British uh, promoted, uh, you know, the martial racist nonsense mm. uh, that we, our military still has a legacy of and suffers from. Um, so Pakistan is not a threat, has never been a threat, can never be a threat. Now you can still, like the Panchatantra, like in the Panchatantra tale, mm. be an elephant that, uh, is shall we say spooked by a mouse and you get off on a, up on a stool and the mouse is running around making a, a complete idiot of you and this is exactly the problem with our uh, relations with pakistan we get to be spooked by pakistan for god's sake and i mean you know and i have gone and addressed and i've uh, you know pakistani or the military audiences in pakistan when i say these things they understand exactly what i'm saying you know and and, and, and that's the it's still great irony for me uh, that the Indian or the military audiences, whom I've been addressing again at the College of Air Warfare, Naval Warfare, the Army War College, Mao, and so on and so forth, for years together, at senior most, uh, you know, training interactive uh, things like CORE, uh, combined operational review and evaluation mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. at the general lieutenant and general level. And, and I have brought this up consistently. And there seems to be an understanding, but there's institutional inertia. Uh, that prevents us from acting on that understanding, basic reality, really. And um, where we went wrong, just as a historical aside, is having reduced Pakistan in 1971, shouldn't that have been the time for us to then begin focusing on China? Because you had mm. reduced, you, you reduced your, uh, you know, assuming Pakistan was ever a threat, you had reduced it, halved it, cleaved it in half, and, it, you know, and, and all you had to do is let the Pakistanis be. Let Pakistan be. Now concentrate your resources and your energies and your policy on, on China, which is the threat that has uh, gotten a free pass, as it were. And, and strangely, that is the primary threat to India. Now everybody's realized what I've been saying for 40, 35, 40 years, that yes, China is a threat. Um, and 
you know, in, in pursuance of that realistic threat perception, I had said that the three strike course need to be disbanded. Uh, what I've called, you know, to make the, it, it go down better, uh, you know, uh, with the army and armor people. I call it, let's rationalize our forces. Uh, and by rationalization, I meant that you convert your three strike corps, rationalize them into one composite corps with a few independent armored brigades. They're more than adequate for any contingency the Pakistanis can dream up at any time in their future, indeterminate future. You know, then we don't need more uh, because anything more is in excess of requirement. And really, we don't need to, uh, you know, it's like. Uh, shall you say, um, killing a gnat with an elephant gun. And I used that metaphor before. You know, I mean, and we tend not to see this. And that's been my great frustration. Um, but finally, I think the army and the government of India is getting on track. Uh, the three of the three strike corps, one corps is now, uh, one corps is now uh, dedicated to the China front. But unfortunately, we haven't, like, uh, Panagar 17 Corps, that's also supposed to, you know, supposed to be an offensive mountain corps, which I've been advocating since uh, I was the advisor of defense expenditure to the Finance Commission, India. Now, that's a constitutional body, not a statutory body. And, and, and meaning all the ministries, including the Defense Ministry, came to the Finance, uh, uh, finance Commission for, um, for um, the resources for the next five years. People don't realize how important the Finance Commission is. And in that classified report, I'd stated all these things. And I had said that that's where our resources need to be concentrated, vis-a-vis -vis China. And we have to get away from this Pakistan fixation. And therefore, to restructure uh, our forces in terms of one core, etc. I think we are getting there. Finally, we are, uh, you know, understanding how futile uh, and how wasteful our policies have been. Um, and, and it has reduced India, really. Uh, what has happened with the Pakistan's uh, primary threat perception is it has reduced India over the last 50 years. And we are what we are. No one takes us really seriously. And that's one of the reasons I argued why we don't deserve to be in the Security Council, honestly. You know, when someone, if you don't get your basic threat perception right, what else are you going to, you know, if you're going to get that wrong, what else are you going to get right? You know, it's a very simple thing. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, and, 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 you know, it's all very well to say you've had peacekeeping forces and stuff. Who cares? Because you're not the people in at the desk making decisions to deploy Indian peacekeepers in Congo or elsewhere, right? You are merely doing the uh, United uh, Nations Security Council's yes, sure. Mm -hmm. which is really a, a what? Um, they don't want to risk their troops in the Congo or wherever else. They send off these, uh, you know, cannon fodder sort of people who are very eager to jump into the fray. Why? Because they get, the, even the Jawan gets the United Nations salary. So it's a little nest egg they built. So there's that motivation there for Indian Pakistan armies or the Bangladesh armies, who, by the way, are the three most uh, largest contributors to the UN peacekeeping mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. Then they call no, no, U.S. is nowhere. U.S. is not there at all. They don't send their forces on these kinds of idiotic missions. Let's be clear about it. They don't. Uh, and they have a standing order uh, that they will not serve any, uh, none of their troops will serve under foreign commanders. Yeah. Certainly not. Uh, you know that. That's why someone like Satish Nambia, who was the first um, commander pro for in the Balkans, uh, the, uh, the, the Balkan War, um, uh, the American troops refused to serve under Nambia. Lieutenant General, who retired as the Deputy Chief of Staff. Uh, so this is, let's be very clear where, what all this is. And this is what I'm talking about, the meta strategic. If you, hmm. because they don't think you, they're equal in any respect. And that is, that begins to then grate on our, well, our morale, of course, and our perceptions of other people, but more, uh, and especially in the sense that you then uh, get equated to the third world type militaries, quite useless, really. I mean, chelta, altu paltu type governments, you know, of no consequence. In other words, a country of no consequence. It's what I've argued India has been all these years. And until we really begin to understand how, what the world respects, we'll never get anywhere to being a great power. Uh, commanding respect, being where you command fear, you command respect. We like to be loved and liked. 
China likes to be feared and respected. They both get respect and they are feared. We get neither, you know, with all the liking and loving that we have been spreading around, we are neither liked nor respected nor loved. So, um, so Pakistan is not a threat, right? So get away from that damn fixation. The sooner we do it, the better. And that requires, but see how the Air Force, your dad was an Air Force. Well, let's say, I mean, what's their force structure like? All short-legged aircraft. Not one aircraft that can go medium range other than Sukhoi 30s that you have now. But if you go into a medium range uh, targeting scheme, uh, you'd uh, beyond that, you'll need refuelers you know, en route. So this is the kind of problems we have. Everything is short-legged except our Navy. Our Navy has long legs, relatively speaking. Again, not enough. Again, as I argued in my Why India is Not a Great Power Yet book, you know, we do not have the tanker to warship ratio, capital ratio, uh, capital ship to a tanker ratio, which is what gives you the legs, sea legs, that it can refuel the ships mid-ocean so you can go to uh, Simonstown, South Africa, or you can go to Sabang. Uh, in in one in one uh, flotilla sortie, as it were, to use a, a mixed metaphor, the air force and the navy. You, so you have a tanker. It's like having a refueler in the air. Mm. So you can extend your legs, you can extend your reach, and therefore you can impose and use your clout at distance. So this is the kind of stuff that I've been recommending again in my dealings with the government, when in, when in government and so on and so forth, that we really ought to be extremely long-legged, hard clout-minded, but at range. Not these short range, you know, what aircraft do we, as I said, there's no aircraft right now, including Rafale that the Air Force jumps up and down about. What kind of range does it have, fully loaded? Same medium range. It's less actually than the Sukhoi 30 MKI. Mm -hmm. People don't realize it. Which is what? 700 kilometers. I mean, come on. This is laughable. And yet uh, you have Air Force uh, chiefs of staff and so on jumping up and down and saying, oh, you know, Rafal said a great thing. So, okay. Yeah. So what is China then? So China is a basic threat in a comprehensive and in a comprehensive sense. It's an economic threat. It's an ideological rival. It's an, you know, uh, it, it is an economic competitor, it's an ideological rival, and it's a military threat. Think of this. No other country in the Indian, uh, shall we say, um, on the Indian Sea poses, poses this kind of comprehensive threat. Nobody, right? Because we are all otherwise friendly with Australia or whatever it is, and America and Russia and so on and so forth. It's just China. Now, why, why is that? Because China, from the very beginning, the, China's attitude has been that we are the, uh, the supernumerary power in Asia. And the world has to acknowledge it. We'll make the world acknowledge it by having the states on our border acknowledge it. Because then you have the entire set of countries on China's border, uh, you know, saying salam to them. And so they're quite happy because in the old Chinese notion, there's the kowtow, right? Where anybody going before the Chinese emperor had to not never look up to his face. They had to be on the knees and literally go down on uh, all uh, fours and, uh, you know, what uh, in Hinduism is called the Shashtar Namaskar, you know, literally. That's what kowtow was. Everyone was required to do it when he went in, um, in, in front of the yellow emperor. Uh, so... How is it different now? How is it different now? The Chinese have always had a sense of themselves, about themselves, the centrality of China mm -hmm. to the world. What, what's the, the word they have, the name they have for themselves? It's not Middle China. Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the, yes, the Middle Kingdom, right? Uh, what is the Chinese word? Um, I've, one of my senior moments, I'm not getting it. But it's the Middle Kingdom, right? Central to the world the affairs of the world and and this is the view they have of themselves what is the view we have of ourselves comparatively lately the prime minister have been talking about vishwa guru now compare the difference between being a vishwa guru and being a central kingdom right this is where 
we are not even in the competition. We are not even in the race. The Chinese have always been very hard, realistic people. They are into applications of technology. They are not into abstract science and mathematics. They did not invent the zero as we did. They did not invent calculus and algebra as many say we did, right? And yet, have we produced anything worth a dime in terms of applications, applied technology? Ille. No. Is that right? Now, think of, any, think of China and think of all the technologies it has spanned over the millennia. And think of anything right now. And they invented it. Think of anything. Computer, they were the abacus was the first computer, right? Uh, paper, gunpowder, the uh, compass. <laughs> I mean, think of anything. It's Chinese invention. What the Westerners did was take from here, like they took the, the Arabs, took the uh, numerals from the Hindu India and made it Arabic numerals, which went to the West, zero, one, two, three, and so on and so forth. Uh, the, the Westerners took the Chinese applications and uh, ran with it and advanced it. Now the Chinese, in a sense, are reclaiming their legacy of big, great technology innovators. We still are into the abstract thing, you know, um, Vishwa Guru. See what I mean? See the difference in our visions? Now, how exactly are you going to become a Vishwa Guru? Beats me. I don't know. Does anybody know? I mean, does the Prime Minister actually know? Is doing uh, popularizing yoga the world over make, going to make you Vishwa Guru? And assuming you reach the status of Vishwa Guru, what good does it do, actually, in real hard terms? Will it get you a, a seat in the Security Council? You know what will get you a seat in the Security Council? And I've been saying this, and I've been bloody-minded about it, but also, I think, very clear. We should blow up the international order, but we like we like to be part of the order that is there, that in a sense has victimized us. But we're happy to be part of it. We're very glad to be part of the NSG. We, we, have, we have pleaded for entry into your security council. Please admit us. You know, who wants to be part of a club uh, you know, that invites you in? in like the old Groucho Marx witticism. I wouldn't want mm -hmm. to join a club that invites me. Invites right? me. Yeah, there's a Groucho Marxian <laughs> witticism which has real, a hard kernel of truth in it. Mm -hmm. That is, that if you don't, that's what I mean by, you know, India not deserving anything. Now, what, how you deserve it is you blow up the international system. Who, why are you bound by the non proliferation treaty when you are not even a signatory? Respond to the Chinese, uh, as I've been advocating uh, and uh, from my time in the first NSAB, uh, and when I was part of the small group that drafted the nuclear doctrine, I've said we should go ahead and, you know, uh, transfer our nuclear weapons uh, technologies to all the states on, Chinese, on China's periphery. Let's see how they sweat bricks. They started it by nuclear missile arming Pakistan, and yet we have forsworn the one option that would have won the Chinese respect, a tit for tat, a hard tit for tat, all right, buggers, you said the precedent, we'll follow you and let's see what you do. How wonderful would it be for the Chinese and how difficult it would be for them if we were to nuclear missile arm Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia. Taiwan. <laughs> Taiwan, but Taiwan has a nuclear weapons. By the way, they don't need our help. But we can join them. You know, the Americans suppressed the China Taiwanese nuclear program. They suppressed yes. the South Korean nuclear program. They suppressed the Japanese nuclear program. Which is why in my 2008 book, I said, all these countries are going to become nuclear. These are the nuclear dominoes that are going to fall. You know, in all these prognostications, I look at in, in a linear projection and, and you get you sort of factor in the complexities and you get the solution. And I've never been wrong. This is where the world is moving to. There'll be more Asian states, and especially after Ukraine, 
which you know forswore its nuclear weapons, gave it away, and now finds itself targeted by Russia. Which what I have been saying. I've been saying that the Japanese, the one thing that the Ch Chinese absolutely fear, and which is what we need to work on, is that they fear a militant Japan. Mm. And I've said we should stoke that fear. The Japanese have, you know, can make a bomb uh, weapon warhead inside of a few weeks. Do you know that? The Taiwanese can do it in about three months' time. South Koreans can do it in about six months' time. All these programs have been suppressed by the Americans, mm. essentially to, uh, you know, um, assert their own um, hegemonic overlordship over these. Yeah, okay. uh, countries, you know, under the guise of there being allied states who in the U.S. will protect. But will the U.S. really protect these guys against China? Will Taiwan be protected? I've always said, from the first day I said in February when the Ukrainians started fighting the Russian, I said the Americans and the West and NATO will fight to the last Ukrainian. Similarly, you know, the Americans will uh, have the they will fight the last Taiwanian, Taiwanese, the last South Korean, the last Japanese. They're not going to come in and fight for you. Are they idiots? Are they fools? Would, would you do it? No. So they won't do it either. They're very simple. No country goes out when their own existence is on, uh, is on the line. Mm -hmm. These are simple existential, these are existential facts. We don't seem to understand that. And therefore I've said, blow up the NPT. The Nuclear Prolifer Non-Proliferation Treaty is the review conference is coming up. And you will have the same DISA guys from our MEA talking nonsense. Disarmed world. Uh, you know, we are the leaders. And, and it, what has it got you, for God's sake? Has it achieved anything other than keeping you a secondary state? A country of no consequence. You might just, you know, believe otherwise. And, you know, lie to yourself and say you matter. You don't matter, really. India does not matter, honestly. Unless India asserts itself in these ways that are going to upset and everybody and his uncle in the international community. This is what you need to do. And you will be invited into the Security Council and the red carpet laid out for you if you act the way you do as an apple cart upsetter. If you upset everybody's apple cart, like, oh gosh, you know, these guys are too much. What, what did Lyndon Johnson say about India, actually? He said it's better to have, um, you know, the dog inside the tent than a dog outside pissing into the tent. Right? He was a Texan. And so they use very earthy language. And this is what I meant. What I have been meaning since you know, uh, in, in my advocacy of these kinds of options, we need to be very hard-headed, hard-nosed about. We have to be less risk-averse. Our entire foreign policy, our entire military policy is risk-averse. Oh, no, no. We don't want to take any risk. No, no, no. This is the history of India, is it not? That's why the great Polish sociologist called India the land of subjugations. Shameful thing. Shameful. But that's what we are. We are risk averse. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take any risk. If you don't want to take any risk, what is it they say about, uh, you know, the great capitalism and, you know, nothing risk, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Right? Nothing gained. Mm -hmm. So nothing gained, and you gain nothing. You're just riding someone's coattails during the Cold War. You rode, uh, you you sort of vacillated, and then rode the Soviet coattails. Then now you're trying to ride America's coattails. Are Baba, when are you going to have coattails for other people to ride on? That's the. And that's this is the million-dollar question, as to use a common phrase or the idiom. And which we are not addressing. We are addressing everything else. We are not addressing that. Do we have the right attitude to be a great power? And if you're not going to be a great power, then don't pretend to be a great power when you're not. Because great power requires certain things that need to 
follow in terms of policies, in terms of your attitude, in terms of your stance, in terms of your military posture, in terms of the equipment you have, equipment profile you have for the military. So unless all these things fall in line, you know, great power becomes a pretense. Right? True. And this, this, this is, but we, we are great pretenders. You know, we pretend to be this, we pretend to be that, you know, so, you know, what's new? That's indeed uh, quite a lot of facts that you've put out, sir. But I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, a simple fact that when you talk about China, and I want to ask you a couple of questions about the last part of your uh, talk. When you talk about China uh, as a strategic threat, uh, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind because I'm, I think, one of the few channels that considers China as the only threat. And I've been talking about China for the past close to two years, of course, a very small time compared to you, you're about 35 or 40. But my focus has been China. I also believe that the threat from Pakistan, whatever it is, is stoked by China. Without China, Pakistan does not stand uh, uh, ground to actually do anything. It's, it's the backing. My main question about the Indian neighborhood uh, and the Chinese influence within that, sir, there is obviously a realization with regards to where the threat lies. This started, if I may, a lot of people like to quote when uh, the defense minister, George Flanders, had mentioned that China is the only threat. And then people started, in my opinion, started at least talking about it. When we see what China is doing in India's neighborhood, and China's got a lead for about, let's say, 30 years, where they've been influencing the le leaders, the people, that so on and so forth. Today, we've started doing stuff in whatever little capacity that we have to negate that particular threat. Do you think we have started in the right direction uh, in terms of the neighborhood? And the second part of my question is you spoke about upsetting the apple cart. Um, would you consider our response to the whole war in Ukraine and our putting the Indian interests in front as probably one of the first steps towards upsetting this particular apple, apple cart? No. And just to answer your uh, last question, the issue you brought up first. No. Sir. Ukraine, you're merely asserting your strategic autonomy that you've been claiming that you are. And how is that new, uh, different from what Nehru did in the 50s? Hmm. When there was actually a Cold War and there was the imminent uh, threat of uh, global nuclear war. Yeah. You, you kept yours to yourself and you said, well, we are no part of any camp. And not only that, you then you were then successful in having the entire third world behind you, the third world block of non-aligned states, which was really the system balancer and which kept the peace. People don't realize how much, how relevant and, uh, shall we say, uh, decisive that aspect was. So what we're doing in a sense is, uh, you know, just not wanting to be part of any conflict that you are you don't have a stake in so how is that a great innovation we did that mm -hmm. that's the whole non-alignment uh, I mean, what is called non-alignment it was a very dynamic uh, uh policy of nehru's and i'm uh, you know i started out as a nehru critic early on way back when in my uh, thing and then suddenly realized by the time i wrote uh, my big fat book nuclear weapons and indian security that my God, this this guy was a classical statesman, in the sense that he understood. I mean, and, and you should read my book if you're keen in uh, any of these things. Uh, you know, and, and his greatest success, as I see it, and this is revisionist history, which I proved with uh, you know by referral to uh, archival documents in the British archives, the American archives, and the Indian archives. Um, and and what did what did it prove? That our entire nuclear weapons policy was such an extraordinary uh, policy of nimbleness. We were so nimble. The Nehru used the uh, global advocacy for disarmament to actually, you know, divert attention from what he was doing at home, where the nuclear weapons complex had a, a dual purpose from the very beginning from the beginning of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in 1947, you know, and, and Nehru called it Janus faced. Janus, as you perhaps are aware, Janus is the Greek god, 
with two faces looking in opposite directions. This is how he spoke by indirection about what he was really doing. And, and uh, the Janus phase policy got us uh, the capability to mix power plants and the bomb. And we reached the bomb threshold six months after Nehru died, well, three months before Nehru died in the spring of 1964. Six months before the Chinese set off their first test, uh, test explosion. Think of it. Had we not, had Nehru not been, unfortunately, the one thing that marred his record, as far as I'm concerned, in a strategic sense, was that having done all this extraordinary policy of keeping attention away, uh, diverting, uh, you know, Western interests away from the secret nuclear weapons program, you know, to saying, oh, global disarmament, this, that, and everybody was saying, oh, yeah, great, great, India is great, you know, and so on and so forth. And then here you are making a bomb. From the very first uh, day of your independent existence, you were on a bomb. Who do you think that can be attributed to? What strategic sense? And I was a critic of Nehru's to begin with. Of course, he had great failings, you know. Having attained the capability, he did not say, okay, go ahead, make the bomb. He, he, he was not decisive. He played the Hamlet, which he always was. The first Secretary General of the MEA, uh, Sir Gijar Shankar Bajpai, actually called Nehru the Hamlet of the Indian politics. You know, indecisive, indecisive at the wrong time. But he was very decisive when he established a nuclear weapons program under Baba, the great visionary Baba, who, by the way, in 1955, even as he chaired the first United Nations Atoms for Peace Conference in Geneva, wrote in a secret cipher message to Nehru that I think we, we need, there, need to be, there needs to be a whole bunch of thermonuclear weapon-owning countries for there to be international stability and peace. <laughs> Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thinking that was there at the center of our weapons program. P.K. Iyengar and uh, people like A.N. Prasad, who was director Bach and A. Gopal Krishnan and I, we wrote a book called Strategic Sellout, the Indian American, India American nuclear deal. Um, we nearly derailed the deal just for first writing. We nearly derailed the deal. And then there were some things done that, you know, uh, which you know, we don't need to get into. But the fact was, this is, these are people who can vouch for the fact that P.K. Ainga, for instance, theoretical physicist, who initiated the thermonuclear fusion weapons project. From the day one in Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Baba said, we are going to make the bomb. For us, day. Does anybody know about that? Until I revealed all this, and Baba, and I mean, all these people were, uh, you know, I uh, had access to all these uh, nuclear stalwarts on our side, simply because my dad was chief engineer Tarapo. So they were colleagues of my dad. Uh, and, and therefore, when they said, oh, you are Bhalsandra Karnat's son, they said, let me, let's tell you. And they spoke out. The 150 pages I did not publish because they're so secret that the people in government of India don't know about it. People in the uh, atomic energy, you know, now a receding generation, those, those people have died and that generation mm. is gone or uh, last of them are there. But have told me things that I can startling and how strategic they were, the visionaries, early visionaries, all that died. The downside of me keeping it so secret, which Nehru thought was necessary, because otherwise you would have the Americans and everybody else jumping on our backs and we needed the food, we needed the aid and so on. We didn't want that kind of attention from the West. We, he kept it secret and subsurface and therefore what happened the downside of that was that within the indian establishment state and the establishment there were no stakeholders for the weapons program see so you no, legacy created. Hmm. no no stakeholders there were no stakeholders yeah. in the bureaucracy ultimately the bureaucracy has to push programs mm -hmm. you know but because they were, they were not stakeholders they said you know we don't even know about this when Shastri became, uh, was hoisted into the Prime Minister's uh, post, uh, when he was told that, you know, we should go for a bomb, he said, what, 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 what bomb? He had no idea, he had no clue. He was Home Minister or Railway Minister or whatever. He was Railway Minister and then Home Minister for a while before he was, became the Prime Minister. So, I mean, 
if nobody knows about it, this is also a problem, very successful in keeping a secret, which is remarkable because one thing the Indian system is not, is that it cannot keep secrets, <laughs> you know, but it kept that secret, right? I mean, tremendous achievement, tremendous achievement. Yeah, yeah. So these are the kinds of things we have lost. And unfortunately, he was an indecisive. Because consider what would have happened had we weaponized when we reached the weapons threshold with our plutonium reprocessing plant that went on steam on stream in uh, March of 1964. We, we would have followed very soon after Chinese uh, explosion to have an explosion of our own and would have been amongst the P6. We would have been in the club making rules, not following rules others have made for you. Yeah. This is the problem. We tend to, we want to be joiners. Instead of upsetting this, damn it, India is large enough. We are either going to be at the top table or we are going to blow this damn thing up. And we'll do it. Is there anybody in government, in the political ranks who thinks this way? No, mm -hmm. because we are just nothing. You know, we just join us. We want to energy. Oh, the great thing America is getting energy. Are Baba, <laughs> you blow up everything. Everybody will want you every, wherever they are because they are fearful that you'll do more harm. And we have not responded to the Chinese. The first thing I said when I, in the NSA, one of the first sessions I remember, uh, the foreign secretary came before us, K. Raghunath, I think his name was, 1998. And I said to him, why hasn't the MEA considered, you know, um, approving a policy of nuclear missile arming uh, Vietnam in the first instance? The one thing the Vietnamese are that Indians are not are the great fighters. They're great yeah. fighters. They have beaten every wretched great power, kicked them out of their country and out of the region, starting with France. Then they beat up on America. Then they beat up on China in 1979. And these are the auxiliaries who beat up China, by the way, the invading yeah. armies. Auxiliaries, not even the main force. Before they came into the field, the Chinese were beaten and they ran away. You know, I mean, Deng Xiaoping said, Ore Baba, kya ho gaya? You know, I mean, we had to declare victory and get the hell out. Best thing. This is it. What would have happened had we said, okay, you want to play, you, you want to play dirty? Let's play dirty. You have done your dirty job, you have nuclear missile on Pakistan. Now let's see what you're going to do with all the states we are going to arm with our technology, which we developed under no constraints. And yet we go and sign a nuclear deal that constrains us, that puts most of our heavy water, light, you know, heavy water, right. moderated light water reactors, which are dual purpose under IAEA safeguards. Who is the negotiator? Jay Shankar, a Joint Secretary of America. What does he do when he's negotiating with the American? He cites writings by Karnad and Iyengar uh, and uh, Prasad and, uh, to say, to tell the Americans, look at what we are facing. So you have to make concessions. So he thinks he's a great negotiator. Negotiation is when you bring the other side to your view, not where you seek a compromise in the middle ground, which really subserves their purposes and you end up serving someone else's interests. And by the way, this I say because in some ways uh, my American friends say that I'm far too American for Indian policy. By that I mean I schooled in the States and I, you know, my, the, I worked with pioneering strategist there, Bernard Brody, who wrote the United States Air Force's nuclear doctrine, founder of RAND and so on and so forth at UCLA. I mean, you know, these are people I've worked with, Albert Wallstetter, you know, um, Michael Intrilligator, who working on weapons, this, that, and the other. Um, they are, I, I'm schooled in the hard power aspects of policy. I appreciate that in the American policy, which is what I find completely lacking in our setup. On hard aspects. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're doing soft power, yeah, yeah, ta, 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 you know. And even there, we don't do it right. We talk to a soft power. We talk to a soft power. Yes, we, we're suddenly woken up, lately woken up to, let me get into that if, if, if I may, because I'm in a flow. The, the uh, you know, you talked about uh, the neighboring states in extended regions, Central Asia included, East African Littoral and so on, and matching the development works, offering, uh, you know, credit, uh, technical expertise and so on. If we did that again in Heruvian times, we sent off our teachers to Ethiopia, etc. You go to Ethiopia and you go to Washington, you go everywhere, all the Ethiopian diplomats, everybody was schooled by Indian teachers. They all remember it. Tremendous goodwill. But the point is, you know, we have all this goodwill that we created. And we have the expertise in terms of software, for instance. We promised uh, Kazakhstan, we promised uh, all the Tajikistan, all these, you know, various stands in Central Asia. We'll give you software, we'll, we'll development centers, we'll do this, we'll do that. Now, we'll be, you know, if you recall just one Singh's uh, great uh, design, the Mekong Ganges Railway. Remember mm. that? The East West. What's happened to that? It would have predated the CPEC and all the Chinese railway yeah, building. Right. Mm. How quickly did they build up their railways that now takes, that can take a Chinese freight train from you in Zhenjiang? all the way into Liverpool. Do you know that? The first train went there two years ago? Yes. Carrying Chinese goods for exports. So why? Because we have plans, we, we sign the agreements, and then we don't uh, deliver. Why? Because our people, we are laggardly, we, we, we are we absolutely you know, unable to deliver on projects that we promise. Because of the you know uh, reporting uh, regulations, you know there's always a financial advisor. They're sitting, oh, the two pesa more, you know, in Burma. Oh no no no, we cannot afford that, and they'll hold it up for years together. That's what happened to the Kanda uh, railway yeah. uh, and and the community connectivity project with Burma. Why is Myanmar turning to China? They're none of this crap. They say they'll build you a bridge. They'll, within a year, the magnificent bridge is ready, and traffic is flowing. We talk of the Kaladan connectivity projects, nothing is done. We still haven't connected uh, to the, uh, the Myanmar's uh, you know, border outpost. Ask Sham Saran, who was the ambassador there and then later foreign secretary. You know, and, and the trouble he had, and I related all that in, my, in that book of mine. Um, I think this is, uh, again, why I think it's why India is not a great power. Maybe my last book, Staggering Forward, Narin Modi and India's Global Ambition, 2018. Uh, you know, all, all this is there. And these are Shams and was foreign sector. I said, as a foreign sector, why the heck did you not push it? He said, Bharat, they're all the coordinate ministries that have to coordinate activities with. Finance, everybody wants to get in on the damn thing. And they, they glitch up the works. Someone will, they, they, they put in one little objection, that's it. Everything comes to a stop, like in any Indian uh, policy making thing. One little noting on a file, that's mm-hmm. it. Everything mm-hmm. comes to a stop. Objection. Everything. Done. Not objection. Just a note. You know, slightly well, you know, a query. That's it. Oh. So we haven't delivered in Central Asia all the things we promised. We haven't delivered any of the infrastructure projects that we promised in our neighborhood that you call neighborhood. We are we are woken up to it, yes. But we're not doing anything. So what's the point of waking up to it? I'm glad we are waking up to it. Shouldn't there be a damn agency that has the prime ministers under the prime minister saying, okay, buggers, none of that nonsense from the finance ministry or any other cognate ministry at the daily level, what we are going to deliver, we are going to deliver ahead of time, not after. And it's going to come in on cost, even if there's a little more, fine, no problem at all. That's a cost we bear. Let's get ahead with it. So we can match the Chinese. But Mm. no, we can't do it. So why... No, how can you therefore compete with China? <laughs> they produce world-class airports literally in two years. Here you have flyover that take three years, and then they don't have uh, you know uh, sewerage and the uh, the drainage systems are gone. I mean, we're just in a monsoon end now. Yeah, I've always joked. What are you talking about? Nuclear strike, first strike on India. We are supposed to absorb a nuclear first strike with a massive retaliation theory. These are kind of the uh, idiotic things. I've joked only half joke because this is reality. 
and I said it there, I think, at, in that uh, mm -hmm. generation, you heard me say it. If you can't take a first monsoon strike, you think you're going to take a nuclear strike and survive with your decision making intact? I mean, you know, I give up, you know, I mean, that's why a lot of what I say, what I write is out of sheer frustration with, you know, the entire system uh, not being strategic in any sense of the word. As soon as we say strategic, we think of Pakistan. I mean, what are you going to think tactical then? Bhutan or something? I mean, sure, go up and beat up on Bhutan. I mean, that's what you're capable of. Yeah, sure, you're very capable. You're capable of beating up on Sri Lanka. You can do that. You can beat up on Maldives. In 2001, the Mozambican government came to us and said, please found a navy for us. Officered by, and I brought that up also, officered by the Indian Navy. We did not take it up. And Navy, mind you, is supposed to be the most strategic-minded service. Mm. I mean, think of it. Okay, army are land lovers. They have no sense. Okay, they can't see beyond the uh, next next hill. Okay, fine. The Air Force, they're in the little thing. They think they're the adjunct of some bigger Air Force, a regional adjunct of a big force. There are no bombers, no nothing. I mean... And now you have a Navy, the most strategic minded, that did not pick up and run with the Mozambican Navy founded by the Indian Navy, officered by the Indian Navy. They would have been in our pockets. And think of Mozambique on the Eastern Littoral. You know, had commanded the Littoral, for God's sake. Zanzibar, uh, Madagascar, the Madagascar Channel. I mean, I've written in my, I think, I think again, the same 2050 India is not a great power yet. You could have you know, placed our ballistic missile subs, SSB and boomers that we're going to get, Ariane, once we get the range with the missiles, we can be the Madagascar channel, which is virtually, no one can touch you. The Chinese cannot, nobody can touch, not even the Americans can, uh, you know, hit you if you uh, are firing your missiles from the Madagascar channel because of various reasons. And you've lost all that? Or rather not lost it, but you're not done anything with it. You're just sitting around. We have a radar station in northern Mozambique coast as a compromise, I suppose. Okay, we'll not uh, fund your navy, but we'll set up our own radar station. Okay, they said, yeah, sure. Meaning, you can take the whole dish, you're opting to get a small little uh, piece of uh, the pie. This is, this is how we are. Baby. So, you know, no matter what government comes in, what government goes out, what people are in the military, what people are out in the military, you know, the same thing that repeated over and over again, ad infinitum. And, the, and, and India stays where it is. Always a small little power. A big power with a small little power mindset. An attitude. And think of, that's where Pakistan comes in. You think of Pakistan, you know, there's piddling little power. They have nothing. And look at the attitude. Uh, you know, see what I mean? I mean, nuclear bomb, I think, yeah, I think, and they know it's all sham, it's right? Sham. It's the attitude, <coughs> and they mean it. You know, I, you know, lie, lie, la, la, this, that, and the other, you know, and I thought you're going to be finished. That's why, you know, I, I, I joke to, you know, the audiences, you know, I've said it. I said, look at the cost exchange ratio if you initiate nuclear weapons. They, you'll have targeting problems. Yeah, two cities, Indian cities will be lost. They're all, all of games, but that is certain, let's say. Let's say the games that we have played here in NSE and uh, played all over in, in here, there, and other places in America and UK and so on, all have the same kind of outcomes. Two Indian cities lost. Which are the two Indian cities? Delhi, Bombay, of course. Uh, Delhi blowing up may not be such a bad thing to happen, but you know, I'm, I'm joking. I'm, I live in Delhi, but you know, I think the whole damn thing will be finished off. The wretched uh, Indian state and the thing we have, completely obtuse uh, kind of a setup we have, and and but all of Pakistan becomes extinct. Yeah, like in extinct as a social organism in the Spenglerian sense, as a social organism, it becomes extinct. And would Pakistan army risk it? Of course not. They're not idiots. They're the most professional army in the world that I know of. Why? Because professional means knowing your limitations. They absolutely understand the limitations. 
but they work on India's risk averse aspect attitude. Because we fear doing anything very massive or anything. Even the 1971 mm -hmm. war, please read uh, General TFR Jacobs' memoir, Surrender in Dhaka. Yes, I have. And what did he say? What was the original directive to Manikshaw from Indira Gandhi, who was the only man in the family uh, in the cabinet and the great, uh, you know, strong-willed woman with some spine in her and all that stuff? The the directive to Manikshaw was very simple: just capture a small sliver of territory in East Pakistan, install a government, or, and we'll install a government of free Bangladesh there, and have it negotiate with Yahya Khan. By the way, that was the political directive. The person who opened the whole day gates to Ghatta was Shagat Singh, four core. It just happened because he is a guy who was a real fighter and an offensive minded guy. Very few of these guys are there in the military, I'm sorry to say. Very, very few instances. He did it again way back in 1967 and in the uh, as, uh, GOC 17 div, Mountain Div. At four core, GOC in C, four core. GOC 4 core. He does it. He gets the heli lift across the Padma and races for uh, Dhaka. Is yeah. then the government makes a oh God, we can take Dhaka. Oh, what are they taking it So, Amanikshaw gets a great credit and he hogs it. And poor Sagat Singh doesn't even get an army, you know, army command. Think of it. Think of it. So our reward structures are all wrong. Our reward structures are all wrong in the military. Who do you prime as a military leader? Who are virtually babus in military uniform? They are. The most bureaucratic of bodies, entities, anywhere in the world is the military. Anywhere in the world. Because they are very strict and very hierarchical minded, very thing. They go to the letter of the uh, law, as it were. Right? So this is this is how it is. And we don't reward our people who show initiative on the battlefield. Who have the strategic sense. Yeah, I'm going to not sit here. He disregarded Aurora's orders, I would say. Haley lifted, not because he had any help from Delhi. Though, to be fair, uh, the uh, the DGMO at that time uh, in, uh, in in this in this thing I think uh, his name was a great guy he helped him he said yes you do it but then everybody woke up after Sajjad Singh had his uh, troops yeah, troops heli lifted across the Padma and the way was open which the Pakistanis did not expect Niyasi did not anyway the, so the only success we have had is that one and it by it was by happenstance not because you planned it in a blitzkrieg, all that was ex post facto rational, rationalizing and justification. Oh, we are so great, we planned it, just tried and we did this. You did nothing. It just happened. You're lucky. Luck counts in, by the way, luck counts in military ventures. Absolutely, luck counts. But the person who exploited the luck got no reward. He was drummed out of service. Because his compatriots feared him. He was so good. So, what I mean is, whoever shows the offensive spirit, who is strategic minded, there is nobody there. And you reward people. I, by the way, I met a lot of very strategic minded. I mean, you know, very, you know, when I used to go to Wellington, they used to, you know, the College of Air Warfare, there used to be younger guys were the ones, who, you know, who were uh, very enthusiastic about what I used to say, yeah, you know, doing this, doing that. But these guys, I realized, were either never promoted, they never got beyond Air Commodore rank, curiously, and, uh, they, you know, no one became, you know, Theatre commanders, very nondescript people, the people generally become theatre commanders and service chiefs and this time. I mean, no, by and large, there are some good people, perhaps, I don't know. So, our entire system, there's something fundamentally wrong from down up. Everything is wrong. 
Why? Because we are still think of ourselves, uh, the Indian military thinks itself as a virtually, as I said, an adjunct to a bigger military, to the British Army and the Western forces before 1947. Now we are for, for ourselves, but we don't do anything with it anyway. Yeah, sorry. No, sir. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, it's always, uh, you know, you, you, you've uh, spoken about a lot of things and you've brought out certain aspects that a lot of us in the younger generation needs to think about because at the end of it today, we are looking at using or not using, I would say, having an India emerge into a place that it actually truly deserves and we don't really see that happening. And uh, I don't know if you notice, but the, the generation which is coming in is the no-nonsense generation. They don't tolerate, uh, you know, a little bit of tarnish on the image of India anymore. And yeah. I think it's it's that aspect of it which is making us today, uh, you know, question things. And that's the reason why we, as this particular generation, have started talking about strategic issues, which, yeah. uh, of course... To, I would say to my seniors was not very important. But today we find that little spark. So I, I hope uh, what you're seeing resonates with the people and we kind of work towards achieving whatever India deserves to uh, to be in the, as a part of the world. And I actually, as far as the UNSE and all that is concerned, there is no two saying about it because, you know, keep on saying the fact that um, uh, we need to be there is not something that will make us be there. But I also appreciate, I think uh, recently a question was raised that, you know, you can keep ignoring us, but that's not going to put us away. So I no, guess, that's a, but that's I for. hope it is a realization, sir. I hope, I mean. <laughs> well, I hope so. But, you know, I mean, that sort of a thing is nothing. I mean, you know, if you yeah, say, yeah. You don't, if you beg for something, you are a beggar. Absolutely. Said, absolutely. Never beg for anything. Take it. Because it's your right. If you feel that's what you have been denied. But don't beg ever. Never be servile. Absolutely. But our entire attitude, India has been known for its civility. We are a servile people, at least historically. Hopefully a new generation will be less so. I and hope so. So that's that's so, the whole uh that's the whole idea of actually talking about strategic issues is one to gain the knowledge because uh we don't want to talk without having a basic know about yeah. issues that face us. It's it's important. Um, of course, understanding China as a as a strategic threat is something that is more uh, to do than we can discuss in one session. And I'd really request if you could actually take this forward in the next couple of weeks and discuss China in detail, because I believe you've, you've visited there, you've spoken to them. Yeah. It'll be nice to hear the internal aspects and the internal thought process that you have observed vis-a-vis uh, -vis China to uh, for us to understand, because as I said today, uh, let me put it in my own aspect. I personally believe China is the most important threat that we've got, apart from a lot of little ones here and there. And of course, uh, the little one here and there are also influenced by China. So that's, I guess, the main threat that faces us today, sir. But till then, sir, thank you so much for taking the time off. Uh, it's it's yes, a pleasure sir. talking to you. I will. I've actually read one of your books. I need to catch up to the rest of them. Okay. Uh, I will be sure Which to do that. Which uh, one, which one? Why is India not a superpower yet? You know, so that's oh, something that uh, I read. India is not a great power yet. The great sure. power, yes. I find that to be a nice historical representation of probably the uh, strategic mistakes, as you put it across. Let me just use that, uh, borrow that term from you that we've made in our history. Uh, till next time, sir, for another very interesting discussion as this one. And Good. looking forward sure. for some more writings of yours. Sure. Jai Hind. Yeah. Good. Thank you.